Good morning, church. My name is Valerie Repass, and you will find me serving in the children's ministry. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the book of Acts, chapter 26, verses 24 through 29. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. This is the word of the Lord. Well, welcome. I'm grateful that you are here and worshiping with us today. Uh, we are nearing the end of the book of Acts. We've been in it forever. So we're going to finish in two weeks, y'all. So uh, if, if you're tired of Acts, you can celebrate that. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, just know we're going to jump into our next series, the Ten Commandments. And so we're going to take a look at each of those as we go through. Uh, it should be a great time. Now, if, if you've been following along in Acts, you know that the, the Holy Spirit led Paul toward Jerusalem, the Apostle Paul. He's been taking the gospel to the nations, and he's been doing great. Like he, I mean, he's suffered through things, but he just keeps going. They put him in prison. He's going again tomorrow. So the Apostle Paul has been extraordinarily resilient in taking the gospel to people that, that really needed to hear it. You know that when he was arrested in Jerusalem, there was a plot to kill him. And so they transferred him to Caesarea, where he got to have gospel conversations with a governor there uh, named Felix. And yet, for two years... Uh, God left him in prison. Now, things really looked up uh, when Felix, the governor, was succeeded by a man named Festus, who uh, we don't know a lot about him, but didn't seem to be as brutal or as cruel as Felix was. And so, again, things are really looking up until Festus came to Paul and said, hey, um, it seems like all the issues uh, that people had with you were in Jerusalem. What do you think if I just sent you back to Jerusalem? Let him try you there. And Paul, knowing how that was going to go for him, he ended up appealing to Caesar. Now, this appeal was the right of every Roman citizen. When you were going to face a hard harsh punishment for whatever crime um, you are, were supposed to have committed, um, you were allowed to appeal, to appeal to Caesar where you could have appear before the emperor to have him judge your case. And so I don't know if that would have gone well or not. The apostle Paul, he appeals to Caesar. And yet in the meantime, the king of the region was a king named King Agrippa. And he and his sister Bernice, they show up there in Caesarea, and they happen to start discussing Paul's case with Festus. Now, Festus was not a Jew. He didn't understand what all of the hubbub was about, why the Jews were upset with Paul, or why Paul differed with them. So he, he mentions the case to Agrippa, who was a, a Jew. What do you think about this, Agrippa? And Agrippa became so interested that he asked to see Paul. Now, this is no small moment, because Agrippa, they have this meeting hall, if you will, um, they prepare this. The Apostle Paul is going to be by himself. He's a lone man who's been imprisoned. And he's brought into this hall where all of the dignitaries, all of the important people of the city, they are processed in. They're paraded in. And so it would have been, it was intended, by the way, this, this entrance or processional was intended to intimidate the other people in the room. It was intended to show how big Agrippa and all of these people were and how small everyone else was. And so the Apostle Paul is in the audience with Agrippa and with Festus and all the important people of the city. And if you want to pick up here with me in verse, well, we're not there yet. In verse 24, we'll, we'll get there. Um, he begins to speak to them about the gospel. Now, this must have been a difficult thing. Again, Paul had been beaten. He'd been in prison. And he'd spoken before some pretty important people. But here's the king and all of the important people in the city bent on intimidating him into submission. And yet the apostle Paul just walks through and shares the gospel in the same way that I've shown uh, that he's done earlier in Acts. He begins by talking about his life before Christ. 
hey, uh, I'm Paul. I'm a Jew. I was raised a Jew. I was devout. Um, I I excelled my peers in Judaism, trained under Gamaliel. I was even a Pharisee, like the most strict sect of Judaism. That was me. Then he goes on to talk about how he met Jesus Christ. One day I was on my way to imprison followers of Jesus in Damascus. When they're on the road, a bright light, he describes it as a light brighter than the sun, shone in front of him. Jesus speaks to him and says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He was Saul at the time. And Saul at the time, he says, who are you, Lord? Jesus says, I am Jesus Christ whom you are persecuting. Now he's telling this story before Festus and Agrippa and all the important people of the city. That's what changed me. As a matter of fact, there on the road to Damascus, Jesus Christ called me to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And he gave them some pretty specific instructions about what he wanted them to do. He said, uh, Jesus sent me to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by me. And Paul's like, that's what Jesus called me to. That's why I'm here today. I believe that God's brought me into this room. That I could, He didn't really say that, but he could have said that God brought me in this room to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with each and every one of you. He was bold in the midst of this. And no, um, it could, his boldness could have been extremely costly. Certainly more imprisonment. He could have wound up um, killed for his faith, and yet he's bold in the midst of this. Now, as you heard, here's who I was before Jesus. Here's how my life intersected with Jesus, and he changed everything. Here's what he's done since then. It's a really simple gospel presentation. Um, if you've ever shared your, the gospel to per, someone personally, you might have used a similar uh, format. You might have pointed people to the scripture. You know, here's what God has done. And yet, the people in the crowd, they didn't recognize that they were sinful people in need of a Savior. They didn't realize they were walking in darkness and needed to see the light. They didn't realize they needed their sins forgiven. As a matter of fact, they didn't respond very well to the Apostle Paul in this moment. It begins with Festus here in verse 24. Uh, This is what he says. Acts chapter 26, verse 24. Festus um, speaks to him. as Paul is still giving his defense. Um, As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Um, But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words. Now, if you've ever shared the gospel or as a believer, uh, maybe you've just acknowledged that you were a Christian and and you've encountered this sort of thought. Like, you're crazy. I... You cannot possibly believe that God created the world, sin entered in, God sent his son, you know, to take on flesh, live a sinless life, died on the cross for for your sins, and then rose from the grave three days later. Like, if you've ever shared the gospel, you've probably heard people kind of mock you for that. And that's what Festus is doing. Paul, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. I I remember when I went to school, Oklahoma State University, um, and I was in the sciences, and uh, for whatever reason, I, I felt compelled to go and share with my professor from time to time. And you would not believe, like, how much they would, like, condescend to me. When I was speaking, like, well, you know, I know you've been raised with this, and these are beliefs that you've had, uh, but they couldn't possibly believe in Jesus Christ. Um, now, one virtue of being, you know, coming through the sciences is I'm not good with empty-headed faith. I don't think it's helpful for any Christian at any time to check their brain at the door when you come to faith in Jesus Christ and be like, I, the Bible says it, your God says it, I believe it, that sells it. Whatever you know, that's not what I believe we're to be as Christians. We are to be a witness that is informed, at least, about who Jesus is and what he's done. What Paul says to Festus here, who is mocking him for his faith, you're out of your mind. You've studied so much, you have lost your ever-loving mind, Paul. Paul says, Festus, What you don't realize is what I'm telling you today is true. And not only is it true, it is rational. For those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, I want you to know that God can handle the the difficult questions. God can handle your concerns. He can handle your doubts. The Word of God is living and active. It's robust. And so when you come to the Scriptures with issues or difficulties, the Scriptures are able to handle those things. As a matter of fact, um, my faith in Jesus Christ, as I studied the sciences and I studied the word more, my faith in Jesus Christ is not ebbed. I'm not I'm like, God, I'm not really sure. I learned these things in the sciences. Uh, my faith in Jesus Christ has become more steadfast. To the skeptic, 
hey, you're out of your mind, Paul says. I'm not out of my mind. I'm speaking what is true and what is rational, what you can come to understand. If you dig into it, you look into the Word. As a matter of fact, during the time of Festus, Paul here is in prison. There likely would have been men and women who were still alive who had seen the resurrected Christ. They could describe to Festus, and I saw the holes in his hands and in his side, and I saw the risen Christ. Paul's like, if you're willing to look into it, you'll find too that what I'm saying is both true and rational. A lot of times skeptics, um, they give you a lot of their concerns, but they're not going to dig into it. They're not going to look into the veracity of the Scriptures and of the events that the Scriptures talk about. And so uh, here is Festus, the skeptic, not receiving at all the gospel that Paul had just shared. Now, that's not the end, because Agrippa is in the room, um, the most powerful man in the room, uh, listening to the words that Paul was speaking. Look what he says here in verse 26. Paul's speaking about the king. He says, For the king knows about the things I'm, uh, I'm, I, and I speak to him boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. Listen, uh, what Paul's doing, he's kind of buttering him up a little bit. Like, I, hey, listen, Agrippa already knows all these things, right? He's been paying attention. He knows the Scriptures. Remember, Agrippa was a Jew. He goes on, I believe none of these things have escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. And Jesus wasn't uh, crucified in some obscure place. It wasn't crucified in the darkness. The risen Christ uh, didn't appear somewhere nobody's heard about. Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross in the, in the center of Jerusalem, right there at Golgotha. Anyone could have seen it. And the risen Christ had even appeared in Caesarea. Agrippa, and I know that you know about these things. You've been paying attention. This stuff didn't happen uh, in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And any good Jew would have said, absolutely, I believe the prophets. Right? I know the law and the prophets were what the Jews held to. I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Paul, you think in this one little setting, I'm going to uh, kind of betray everything I believe my whole life. Am I really going to now convert to Christianity from Judaism? Agrippa rejects Paul. On this day, he rejects the gospel. So Paul, in his preaching, he's now been mocked by Festus and rejected by Agrippa. And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Now what we have here in the Scriptures is an account of the Apostle Paul very boldly declaring the gospel to pretty powerful people. It could have been costly to him, but he did it anyway. And on this day, nobody came to faith in Christ, as far as we can see. Festus didn't. Agrippa didn't. No of the prominent, none of the prominent people that we read about, as far as we can see, came to faith in Christ. And sometimes we might be tempted to think, is it even worth it? As a matter of fact, if you live in our culture... It isn't very friendly uh, to Christianity. Um, the exclusivity of Christ, some of these difficult things that we would teach, um, it, it can often be tempting for us to kind of step away from the table, right? Like, and maybe buy into what our culture would say is, you know, you believe what's good for you and I'll believe what's good for me and, you know, don't worry about the other things. You know, if you'll kind of keep your faith to yourself, I'll keep my faith to myself and none of us will have to be upset. Church, I believe that that would be exactly what the enemy would want. I read an article this past week that evangelism is dying in the American church, which means people speaking the gospel to people that need to hear it, it's dying in the American church. It's true of Baptist and Methodist and, you know, any of the other denominations. It's, it's going away. People are almost not doing it anymore, and I believe it's in response to the pressure of our culture. So today... Um, I, would, I want to say to you, I hope that we're never that church. I hope that we never stop declaring the goodness of Jesus Christ to people that need to hear it. And I hope we never stop declaring the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we can complain all day long about the things going on in our culture. Sinful things, broken things in our world. But I want you to remember, we, the church of Jesus Christ, we are the hope of the world. Uh, I doubt we'll change people's minds politically, uh, but my hope is that we'll change their hearts as we present the gospel to them and they trust in Jesus Christ. So today I want to give you um, just three reasons uh, why we share the gospel, why we would dare, uh, why we would hope for people to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, because it's easy for us 
uh, to get busy. And we go about our, our days, right? We work next to people and just to be unconcerned about their souls, unconcerned about what they believe, how they're living, what's going on with them. I'm going to give you three reasons why we hope for people to receive the gospel, why we share the gospel when it's difficult and when it's awkward. Um, go ahead and turn with me back to chapter 26 in verse 18. And this is why God, Jesus Christ himself, called Paul to tr- preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Read with me here um, in verse 18. This is Jesus. And he says, before that, he says, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may return or turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. They may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The first thing, the first reason that we just keep on sharing the gospel, we hope for people to be saved. We, we enter into difficult and, and sometimes costly conversations. Why do we do that? Because the darkness, or I'm sorry, the gospel makes us see. The gospel gives us eyes that see and ears that hear. Um, anybody a true crime podcast fan here? Anybody admit it? Like three of you? Okay. Uh, my wife really likes them. That's the only reason I know. I, I like to listen to them sometimes, true crime podcasts. And I heard one uh, a few days ago or a couple weeks ago. It was about a young man on a college campus. And so um, he, you know, college kids, they stay up super late. So he had been at his friend's dorm and then he goes to another friend's house. And I guess they're, they're probably drinking. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, he's at his friend's house. He realizes it's really late and he left his jacket and, and he needs it. And so he makes his way from the friend's house going to his other friend's dorm. And of course, he gets there really late and finds all the doors are locked. And so he's beating on the door and nobody answers, you know, and spends a little more time, checks, none of the doors are open. So he he begins to, even in the darkness outside, make his way around the building, you know, and he's like, I'm going to find a door here. And he did. He actually found a door that was unlocked. And so he opens the door, he goes inside, it closes behind him, and man, he's in pitch darkness. What he didn't know was that he was in the electrical room where all the high-voltage lines that powered all of the the housing there, they came in, and of course the voltage was stepped down to uh, usable voltage by the the housing there. So he's in this pitch-black room reasoning, if I can get through this room to the next door, I can probably get inside, go upstairs to my friend's room, get my jacket, and we'll go home. Life will be good, right? Um, and so he begins, while he's in the room, to kind of feel his way around the walls. It's dark, and so he's, you know, he's making his way down the wall there, kind of feeling. And what he doesn't know is he's really close to this massive transformer where these high-voltage lines are coming in. Now, the good news is that the transformer is, is shielded uh, to where, you know, there's no electrical arcs. You're not going to get electrocuted, um, except for this one place. So the young man, he's feeling his way down the wall. He finds a corner, begins to work his way down the wall, and he gets really close to this big machine, um, And it begins to squeeze him, you know, and he has to kind of work his way in. I guess he thinks, I'm just going to keep going until I find a door, right? And so he pushes and pushes and pushes until at one point he reaches. And not knowing what it was, his his finger actually um, went in one of the few holes, one of the few places on this entire uh, electrical machine uh, that wasn't shielded. And he was electrocuted. Of course, the, the whole podcast is about, you know, where this guy went, and they searched for him for a week before they found him. Uh, But I tell you that story to say, uh, when we wander around in darkness, we're destined to get hurt. When we wander around in the darkness trying to find our way when we can't see, we're going to get hurt. It happens every single time. If you've ever gotten up in the middle of the night, right, and you're walking through your house, like you're going to hit something because you can't see. And while that's great news for many of us as believers, because we're like, man, we have the Word of God to guide us. We have the Holy Spirit that leads us. Jesus is our example. How cruel would it be? If we work next to people every single day, sat next to them in school. We shop with them in the stores. We sat next to them at our kids' games. And we never took the time to, to share the gospel with them. The gospel that makes us see. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And he tells us the enemy has come to steal, kill, and to destroy, right? That's darkness. But I've come that I might have life and have it to the fullest. How cruel would it be for us to know the way and the truth and the life, to see the path that God has given us in his word that teaches us through his spirit and following after Jesus. We sit idly by while our our friends, their lives, their families are destroyed. It's dangerous to wander around in the darkness. Matter of fact, even after I've been a believer in Jesus Christ, there are times I've rebelled. I've chosen to go my own way. I thought God didn't know what he was talking about, you know. And it's 
extraordinary pain for me and for my, my wife and for my family and for people around me. We know this to be true. The gospel makes us see Jesus, invites us to follow after him, that we might experience the life that is greater than any other life, that abundant and full life that's only available in him. Why do we have the hard conversations? Deal with the awkwardness? Risk the relationship? Because the gospel makes us see. And when people can see the truth and follow after Jesus, their, their lives and their marriages and their families can be restored in him. So we jump right in and we share the gospel. The second thing uh, that Jesus tells the Apostle Paul, the reason that he sent him to the Gentiles, is I'm sending you to open their eyes so they may, return, they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. The second thing the gospel does for us is the gospel makes us free. The gospel makes us free. What you may not realize, but it's true for every single one of us, is that before we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we were enslaved to sin. And you say, uh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't enslaved to sin. I could have done good, good things and avoided the bad things. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome, in Romans 6, 17 and 18. He says, but thanks be to God that you who once were slaves of sin, right? Every one of us before Christ, slaves to sin, that you who once were slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. So what's true of every single one of us is that apart from Jesus Christ, we are enslaved to sin. I, I remember being a, a kid, and I, I got a lot of whippings as a kid, and there were times that I would literally um, uh, learn the lesson about pride because I would think, I haven't got a whipping today. You know, like, I'm killing it. I'm doing so good. And then that afternoon, here it comes. You know, I do something, I, I get a whipping. Um, I really tried hard to be good. I grew up in this church trying really hard to be good. I didn't always do such a great job of that. But I fought against sin. I fought to do the right things. The problem, I was enslaved to sin. And as much as I might fake it for a moment, as much as, as, much as I might push off sin for an instance, it was right there the next day. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, it sets us free. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer slaves to sin. We actually become slaves to righteousness. God sets us free from the thing which once bound us. If you've ever walked in an addiction, maybe you don't call it an addiction. It's just one of those lifelong struggles, right? If you've ever walked in any difficulty or wrestled with sin, you know this to be true. You can't overcome it on your own. The power of Jesus Christ the power of the gospel in us, it sets us free from the things which, which once bound us. But it goes further than that, though. It's not just practical righteousness we're talking about here, right, where we can start to live better lives and leave aside those things which one once ensnared us. Uh, there's also positional righteousness here. You know what I'm talking about? So practical righteousness is just doing the right things every day, right? And that's important. We want to do that. We want to avoid the destructive things in our lives. But he goes on here in this text, and he tells us that there's also positional Righteousness, which is kind of our standing before God uh, here in verse, uh, in verse 18. He says, to deliver them from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. So what's true of every one of us in this room, if you know the gospel, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wage of that sin is death. And to be honest with you, man, the burden of sin, the weight of sin, it's too much for us to bear. We can't be good enough to overcome our bad. We can't live right enough lives before God. We cannot rescue ourselves from our sin. As a matter of fact, the curse on our lives, the punishment for our sin is death. And yet, because of the gospel, in Christ Jesus, we are set free from the wage of sin that we absolutely owed, right? We owed it, but Jesus Christ bore our sin and our shame for us on the cross. And what happened there is he took all of our sin, our guilt, and our shame, and he credited his righteousness to us. So we're no longer bearing the burden of our sin and our past and our guilt and our shame and the things we want to leave behind. The gospel sets us free. The gospel will set you free. So why do we share? Why do we hope for people? It's not because we want to have a whole bunch of Christians in the world, like people who call themselves Christians, right? Um, it's not so that we can have, you know, mega churches or anything. What we want for people's lives, we want them to see. 
We want them to know the way, the truth, and life, and to walk in victory in this world. We want people to be set free from their addictions and the power of sin in their life. And the final thing uh, here, why do we share? It's because the gospel, it gives us a new identity. Here at the end of 18, it says that, I'm sending you to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and, listen to this, in a place among those who are sanctified by faith within me. Now, that kind of the root word for, um, uh, for righteousness there, the sanctified word there, it's, it's the Greek word uh, hagios, which means holy. And so if I, I talk about you and I said, hey, how many of you think you're holy out here? You have, most of you probably like, Heck no, I'm nowhere near holy. Like you look at yourself and your life, if you had to write the story of your life, it would be anything other than holy. And yet what he says here is that we, in Christ Jesus, because of the gospel, receive a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now here's why you and I can be holy before God. In the Greek, the mood um, here, it's passive. So if you were to read this word, and you say kind of a lot um, with the Greek word endings, it's in the passive mood, which means this holiness, this righteousness that we possess, that we have this standing in, it's not us. This is what Jesus Christ did to us. We received it passively. He was the one who did the work. We're the ones who received it. So here's what we have because of the gospel. When we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have a place among those who are sanctified by faith. We have a place among God's holy people, among his children, as children of God. And it's not because of our work. It's not because of your goodness or even how bad you ever were. It is simply by virtue of the grace of Jesus Christ for you. He is the one who makes us. Holy. You know, when I talk to people, this might sound simple to you and like, okay, no big deal. You know, when I talk to people, believers and unbelievers alike, you know what I get? I get a whole lot of their past. I get a whole lot of, I don't belong here. I get a whole lot of, you don't know what I've done, you don't know where I've been. You don't know the people that I've hurt. And people think, no, 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 there's no place for me in God's family because of what I've done. And people carrying sin and shame and guilt and burdens for their entire life. Listen, the gospel gives us a new identity. It helps us see. It makes us free. It gives us a new identity. We are not our sin. We're not our past. We're not our mistakes. We're not what we once were. We are now made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've got to start living like it. Man, we're the people of God. When God looks at you and see your past, he doesn't see that thing you're ashamed of, the lies you told, the people you hurt. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Here's what Jesus did when he went to the cross. He bore our sin and our guilt and our shame. And that perfect, holy, righteous life that he, he led, he credits that to us. So when we come before God, we don't have to pray in fear. We can come with boldness before the throne of grace because of what Jesus has done for us. We have communion with the God of the universe. He knows our name. He's adopted us into his family and wants to hear from us and work on our behalf. The gospel gives us a new identity. Here's the hope we have in Jesus. This is why we sing This is why we gather here in this place and we celebrate the work of Jesus for us. But wouldn't it be a tragedy if we just kept it to ourselves? A world full of people who desperately need to hear. A world full of people that we want to see them set free. We want to see God give them eyes that see and ears that hear. We want to see God give them a new identity. So as the people of God, we offer ourselves in service to him. In, in the same way that Jesus served us, we serve other people. same way that Jesus loved us, we love other people. In the same way that Jesus showed compassion to us, it compels us to go to other people. What I'm not doing today is trying to heap a big burden on your shoulders once again. you got to do this or God won't like you, right? Or, or you're like a B-level Christian if you're not sharing the gospel. What I hope to do is to show you what Jesus Christ has done for you. And that in worship to him and out of love for other people, you will go and share this good news with other people. Now, I talked about Festus and Agrippa. Two sorts of people when they hear the gospel. And maybe you identify with them. Maybe you're the skeptic. And you hear the the gospel and the scriptures and you think, sounds crazy. These people sound like they're out of their minds. 
And I want you to know that Jesus Christ died for you too. That Jesus Christ died that your sins could be forgiven. Jesus Christ died that you might be adopted as his as well. And we don't know the story about Agrippa and Festus, but Paul's hope is that they would receive the gospel and be saved. And, and my hope for you is that you would receive the gospel and be saved. And that people like Agrippa in this story, people that Agrippa was a Jew, he knew the Bible, he understood Judaism, and he was this close to Jesus. But he wasn't yet a believer. And if you're here today, and you're, you're one of those people, and you spent your whole life in church, you did Awanas, right? You, 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 you memorized the verses, sing the songs, you know how to act the part. But as you think about your life, you think about faith in Jesus Christ, your heart has never been transformed by him. And today I would invite you to trust in him. Y'all, we live in a world full of Agrippas, right? We live in the South. Everybody's a Christian, right? Everybody's heard the gospel message. It's terrifyingly few who truly know and follow after Jesus. So if that's you today, I'll tell you a story. I first started the ministry. I was crazy. A church hired me at 22 years old. I was their full-time youth pastor, right? And uh, my pastor there, um, his wife, she was an amazing woman. She was raised in church. She knew the scriptures. Of course, she, she came up. She married a pastor. She was a pastor's wife. She taught the class. Um, but one day while her husband was preaching, she realized, man, I've been running, running through all the motions. I know all the things people look to me to teach in the Bible, but I don't know Jesus Christ. Man, if that's you today, I want you to know that today is the day of salvation. If God is drawing your heart, just respond in faith to him. The day can be the day of salvation, the day that you celebrate for the rest of your life, the day that changes your life and the life of your family. Would you bow with me? Uh, Father, uh, we thank you again for the, the goodness of the gospel, for how it transforms us. God, that you, you help us to see. We don't have to wonder how to, how to make our way through this life, but instead we just follow you in faith. God, I thank you for how the gospel sets us free, that we're no longer beset by sin and enslaved to it, but we're now free Slaves of righteousness, God, I thank you that you give us a new identity that we're not what we once were, but now we're declared righteous and holy in you. Lord, for those in this room who are unbelievers, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that you would draw their hearts to faith in you. Um, for those who are here and have just misunderstood the gospel, misunderstood who you are and how you operate, today I pray that they would see what you've done for them and respond with joy and gratitude to you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.